Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. The Onyx Hunt app is the number one hunting GPS app, turning your mobile phone, your computer into a working GPS. So the Onyx Hunt app right now, this time of year is the time you should be using it almost as much as you are during hunting season, if not more in scouting for the upcoming years for spring scouting when it comes to mountain bucks utilizing the new 3d feature so you can see things as you would see it in the woods it's an incredible time to to be scouting if you want to learn more about mountain buck scouting i have a youtube series over my youtube channel at the channel's name is just Bo Martonic, and you can find how to use the hunt app as well as in the field scouting to be able to apply that to set you up for success this fall. If you want to try out the Onyx Hunt app, head over to onyxmaps.com, use the coupon code EMW, and that'll save yourself 20% off of the app. The podcast is also brought to you by Tethered. Tethered is redefining ultralight hunting. They're for saddle hunters by saddle hunters. And they have so many different options now. It seems like they keep continuing to put out innovative gear. And when it comes to saddles, they have anything from their Mantis saddle, which is their foundational piece that they built up to their, the ultimate Cadillac for adjustment and comfort, which is the Phantom. And then the Menace saddle, which is might, might be built for uh, bigger guys and girls out there that want a little bit more comfort and and then also down into the Eberhardt series saddle. So a bunch of different options that you can choose from all over at tetherednation.com. Maven Optics. So Maven has been taking the optics industry by storm with coming out with the highest quality products competing against the top competitors at half of the cost by doing that through the direct-to-consumer business model. Maven has a ton of different spotting scopes, binoculars, monoculars, uh, rifle scopes, everything in between. They have it all over on their website. And I've been using Maven Optics for about five years now. The, it's just the quality is second to none. The, the biggest thing that I like about it is the low light visibility has completely changed the game. So if you want to head over to mavenbuilt.com, you can check out all of their products and get to see them on the website. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. But if you decide to buy something, if you use the coupon code East Meets West dash gift, you get yourself a free gift with any full price optics order. So check that out. And last but not least, I have a deal that I want to share from our friends over at Exodus. So Exodus, the Exodus render, which is a Verizon 4G LTE cell camera, is available for pre-sale once again. The, the demand for the product this past year was incredible, and they sold out. It was tough to keep them in stock, especially during their annual Black Friday sale. So starting now, they're extending some of the best pricing of the year to the listeners of the podcast here. And for all of January, you can save $35 off of each camera by using the code RENDER35. And that also works with their solar panel bundle and security bundle. So make sure that you head over to exodusoutdoorgear.com and sign up for the newsletter to, to get more information on different pricing. So if you're not familiar with Exodus, all their cameras are backed with a five-year no BS warranty and includes a five-year theft and damage coverage. So they have the best trail camera warranty in the industry. I'm running probably about 15 Exodus cameras at this point. I've been building them up over the last few years, and they are by far the most reliable cameras from battery life, uh, picture quality, everything is great. So head over to ExodusOutdoorGear.com and check them out. All right, so I want to get into the episode by going through the, the Mountain Buck Monday brought to you on Tuesday story, and this one comes from Taro Tanaka. So Taro sent me a message on Instagram that said, hey man, I just wanted to reach out and show some appreciation for your podcast. I've learned so much from you about hunting here in PA. I would love, I, I would listen to it almost every day at work. I was able to shoot this buck 
on the downside wind of a four-year-old cut. I watched him go into it before daylight and was able to call him back out and shoot him at 15 yards. So I have this, the picture of Taro's buck over on the Instagram and Facebook page at East Meets West, and you can check that out. Such a beautiful Pennsylvania mountain buck, and I'm really thankful that Taro shared this story with me. I've got a ton of them that have come in, and I want to keep getting more to, to continue this Mountain Buck Monday going on here. So share your stories, and I will share them on here. All right, so... On this week's episode of the podcast, I have Ryan Mickler. So Ryan is the host of the Order of Man podcast and owner of Order of Man, which is a lot more than that, as you'll hear in this uh, in this podcast episode here. And this is comes to, at a really good time of year um, for creating a plan and crushing your goals. I talked about goal planning a few episodes back, and you might think, how does that you know, how is that in a relation to hunting and why are you talking about this? Well, it's everything to do with it. As you're planning, as you're budgeting, as you're figuring out how to allocate the time, the money, the planning, all that stuff, goal setting and crushing those goals is really what you need to be able to, to be proficient at, to, to be able to succeed. And, you know, and there's so many different, everyone's got a different situation. And I think that, Ryan talking with with me on here really help will help a lot of listeners out as it helped myself with calibration of how to how to be able to succeed at these goals and being able to break them down into small daily tactics to be able to complete them. So I hope you like this episode and we have a lot more coming up here in, in future episodes of the podcast. So thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next week. All right, we're live and sitting across the Zoom screen here uh, with Ryan Mickler coming out of Maine, the Order of Man podcast. Ryan, it's good to have you on. Yeah, man, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this discussion since, I don't know, what's it been, three, four weeks since we hunted together in Pennsylvania, so that was a pretty good time. Yeah, what was that, the first week of December, end of November, yeah. something like that? Yeah, somewhere in there. I, it kind of all blends together at this point anymore, but... Um, Regardless, I had a good time. My boys had a good time. It was good to meet you. The, I showed you that picture, didn't I? That uh, my son had pointed out in in a magazine that he had found. I think he had picked up. Yeah. And he's like, "Hey, that's the guy we hunted with." But you had long, you know, beautiful locks and a little <laughs> different than now. So yeah, it's the same mustache, long hair. <laughs> that's right. He recognized the stash. It must have been the stash, man. You know, it's it's funny. I uh, when I started this podcast is about the same time when I started growing this mustache and it kind of started as a joke. I had, uh, uh-huh. uh, I'd always, I always grew it out during hunting season. I called it the rut stash and I started the podcast and went to the first total archery challenge, which is like where I first started recording anything. I told you a little bit about it, but, um, I, I, when I was there, I did a, a video shoot for prime archery. They were just grabbing people, um, basically that shot their bows and wanted to do like mm. kind of a testimonial thing. And, and I ended up making some commercials and everyone's like, there's that guy with the mustache. No one knew my name, but they knew the mustache. So it ended up being kind of a part of my, that's brand. how it was for me with my beard, my beard. I, I don't know if you ever followed along with what we were doing when my beard was like down to here. Mm-hmm. But I shave or I uh, trimmed the beard. Obviously, I don't know, maybe six months or so ago. But uh, yeah, most every when I got started, most people knew me for my beard, not anything important I had to share. Say, <laughs> well, it was funny because when I when I met you at Kip's place, like I I didn't I knew you looked really familiar, and I couldn't figure mm-hmm. it out. And I'd listened to your podcast before and stuff. I it just it took me a minute to kind of yeah. And you said your name, yeah. and I was like, oh, all right. That's that, funny, man. That makes sense. Cool. But yeah, you and I met um, recently, like you said, through a mutual friend, Kip Folks. And yeah. how did you end up down there? Or how did you get to know Kip and hunting down there? Kip and I have known each other for a couple of years. I think we just connected on Instagram or something. You know, we were following each other, had some mutual friends. And uh, a couple of years ago, he said, hey, uh, I've got this hunt, this uh, spot and stock hunt in Arizona happening. And one of the guys that was going to go can't make it. He had to drop out for some reason. Uh, would you be interested in going? I'm like, yeah, sure. That sounds great. So uh, that was when I was living in Utah. So it was a quick, 
you know, five, five hour drive or something like that for me. So I drove down there, met with him, a couple other guys, and then we hunted together over a couple of years and just stayed in contact. I introduced him to some other friends. He came up here to Maine. We hung out for a little bit. Uh, We just been in contact and, uh, and he said, Hey, I've, I've got this property in Pennsylvania. Bring your boys out. I'll bring my boys out. We'll have a weekend. And so he invited me out and uh, about 80 to 85% of the time when somebody invites me on a hunt, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll make it happen. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it was, man. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So I, yeah. So that, like I said, it was funny that I had met you there and as I had listened to your podcast over the last few years and had been, you know, like I said, a listener anymore, I don't listen to a whole lot of podcasts. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I used to, like, I was obsessed with them and that's when I ended up starting my own. But then as time it became shorter and my commute to work became shorter, it uh, mm. lessened the amount of podcasts I listened yeah. to. So there's been a few that, that I have stayed loyal to listen to. And one of those was yours. And I um, that. so that, that was pretty cool. But uh, so before we get going here, um, it, the listeners of this podcast may or may not be familiar with yourself and what you have going on. So let's hear your little, your elevator pitch here about who you are and what yeah. you got going on. Yeah. I mean, anytime anybody asks me that question, I mean, first and foremost, I, I pride myself on being a, a husband and a father. I own Order of Man, which is an organization that gives men the tools and resources they need to thrive. So we're teaching them how to network, how to create systems and plans for production, how to get their health dialed in, grow their businesses, grow their bank account, anything that's related to them improving their lives as fathers, husbands, business owners, leaders in the community. That's what we want to equip them with. So we've been doing that for about what's well, almost six years now. Uh, and we primarily do that through the podcast. We've had David Goggins on, Stephen Ronella just came on a couple of weeks ago. Um, Andy Frasilla. I mean, I, I hate to even mention names because the lineup of men that we've had on is phenomenal, which is a testament to the fact that men want this information and they want to hear from other men. So that's who I am. Um, I, I, I enjoy hunting. Uh, I haven't been hunting that long. Actually, I've only been hunting for November was my three year anniversary of hunting. So I haven't been hunting that long. But I wanted to delve into the process because I think uh, it had some potential for helping me become a better man, and that's proven to be true. Yeah. So how did how did that process go as far as getting into it? Because getting into hunting isn't necessarily an easy thing. I don't I, I don't know that it's not easy. I, I think it is actually. Like I think if you just turned to your circle and you just looked around and exerted any amount of effort, you'd probably find somebody in your either immediate circle or just outside of it who hunts. I, I really do. So, but you do have to exert yourself. For me, I'm pretty fortunate uh, just because I have access to a network that I realize a lot of individuals don't have. But I had a, uh, a listener reach out. And just like I said, about 80 to 85% of the time somebody invites me on a hunt, I'm in. Like, let's go try it. And I had a listener. His name is Colin Cottrell. Um, he's actually a good friend now. He reached out to me. I think we actually initially met, if I remember correctly, we did. He said, I, I posted on my Facebook group. I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to get down to shot show. Does anybody have a ticket or an in? And he reached out and he's like, Hey, I can get you in. And I'm like, yeah, right. We'll see. You know, everybody over, over promises and under delivers. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll see or whatever. And sure enough, he got me in. And so we met there and then he's like, Hey, would you ever be interested in int- uh, interviewing Ted Nugent? And I'm like, yeah, of course that'd be rad. He's like, Oh, okay. He jumps on his, on his phone and texts Ted and he's like, Hey, go on this podcast. And then like a week later, Ted and I were talking. So, I mean, he's a man of his word, right? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, this guy's solid. So uh, after we did SHOT Show, after I talked with Ted, he reached out and he's like, hey, I've got a friend in Texas who needs to manage some of his land. He wants us to hunt deer. We're not looking for trophies. We're just trying to trying to manage the land, get some of those mature bucks that aren't you know good for breeding out of the out of the mix, out of the breed. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I've never been hunting before. He's like, yeah, that's why I wanted to invite you. I'm like, so is it a rifle hunt, bow hunt? He's like, it's both. So bring your rifle, bring your bow. I'm like, well, I have neither. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he pointed me in the right direction. He, he showed me a couple of people to follow. He gave me some tips and I went down there. And I, if I remember correctly, the first day, in fact, that deer right there is the very first deer that I ever shot. So you can see like, I, I don't know how well you can see, but it's a, it's a, it was a big mature buck. Yeah. It's just a really interesting 
funky looking set. rack like, on them. Yeah. Yeah. Like you wouldn't want that in your, in, you know, if you're trying to manage the land. So, um, yeah, I shot him with my rifle the first day. And then two or three days later, I shot another deer, uh, another buck with my bow and I was hooked, man. I loved it. And he actually, Colin actually took me and my son on my son's very first hunt as well. So he's, he's not only impacted my life, he's quite literally and directly impacted generations at this point. Yeah. So it's funny you say that. Uh, so Colin, I don't know him that well, but we've messaged back and forth on Instagram. Oh, right. Yeah, anything cool. usually, you know, start and uh, followed along his stuff and vice versa. I've chatted back and forth, but uh, that's, that's really awesome that he, you know, he's as solid as they come, man. Yeah. Put himself out there to, to be able to help you out. So what was that? What was that, I guess, process or the timeline from the time you bought your bow or got your bow to when you went on that hunt? How long of a time was that? It was maybe like six to eight weeks. It wasn't long at all. Yeah. It's it's very, very short time frame. But, you know, I'm the kind of guy that if I'm going to commit to doing something, like, I'm all in. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Yeah. So it was a, and and he said, there's an opportunity. I'm like, okay, well, this is the opportunity. It's not like I can say, hey, can we wait two more months to make it happen? It's like, no, this is when he got invited. This is when I was invited. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time. um, I, I was following, I think I was following probably Cam Haynes at the time. Uh, John Dudley, Dudley's been on the podcast now a couple of times. Like I was, I was Adam Greentree. Like I was following these guys anyways, cause I was intrigued with what they were doing. Uh, and that helped me kind of figure out, you know, what do I want? What do I look for in a bow? Dudley's, uh, expertise was really helpful. So I, I'd shot a rifle. I mean, I was in the military, so I was comfortable around firearms, but the bow thing was a little tougher for me, but yeah, it couldn't have been more than six to eight weeks. It was very short. Yeah. I was going to say that's, it's definitely impressive, but John Dudley is one of the best educators in my opinion from He's you know, great the coach, stuff man. he puts out like is just incredible. And he, he explains it in a way that anybody can learn. You know, there's a lot of things that I relearned because I learned it the incorrect way, you know, the first yeah. time around and yeah. kind of had to retrain myself and it was, he's a very, very good coach. So that's, that's really yeah, cool. He's got the, uh, the heart of a teacher. Like you can tell, and I, and I've been fortunate enough now to have personal conversations with him and even individual coaching. Uh, and, and he's just, he just loves the art. He loves the craft. He loves the hunt. He loves everything about it. And me as a novice hunter, you know, I'll go out there and enjoy the experience and try to get my equipment dialed in as best I can and get my practice in so I can be efficient and effective and, and, you know, ethical. But to see him pour out over all of the details and the nitty gritty and tie it this way and do this thing. And man, it's pretty cool to see him in his element. I I like not just Dudley, but again, with my fortunate position to be able to see masters of their craft, just pour everything into the details that most people would just casually overlook. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's so true. And when, so, you know, yourself getting into hunting and then also your, boys to uh to be able to learn as well which i got to meet yeah. your sons in pennsylvania there and yeah. was that was that your son's first buck yeah it was his first deer ever your first deer it yeah was, yeah yeah he shot that nice six point mature six um like a beautiful yeah, pennsylvania six point like <laughs> this thing was it was a beautiful deer awesome i mean yeah and they had had pictures of it for years i mean just an old deer and to see his face and how excited he was and like asking questions as, as we're sitting there and we're butchering it and going through like he was just yeah it i don't know it, that made my night for sure he's um well he's obsessed i was gonna say psychotic about it <laughs> <laughs> but like, but he, but it's not to an unhealthy extreme, but he is legitimately obsessed. That's why he saw that picture in that magazine. Like if he sees a magazine, he's buying it. If he sees or hears something, he he's always asking dad, can I watch this hunting video? Can I see this? And then he helps me with the fulfillment of our merchandise store, hat shirts, things like that. And every day without fail, like the only, we're only talking about hunting and bears and like this weird thing bears do that nobody knows and like he just pours over all of it he loves it and so to see him to be to be able to be with him the cool thing the coolest thing about that hunt i'll tell you what i mean just being there with my boys was a lot of fun but the coolest thing about that experience for him is that last day he came to me and he said in the afternoon before that last sit of the evening he came to me and he's like dad i really want to sit at this place 
And I'm like, why? He's like, I don't know. I just feel like that's going to be a cool place to be. I'm like, okay. And he said, I want to sit in a tree stand. So he's 12 years old. And I said, that's, that's fine, bud. But you got to know there's no double tree stands. Like if you're going to sit in a stand, it's you by yourself and me and my other, my younger son, I have four kids. So those are my two oldest boys came with me. So my second, I said, him and I are going to go sit in a blind at the other end of this, this food plot. He's like, okay, that's fine. And I said, just know if you go up there, you're not coming down. I don't care if you're cold or you're bored or you're tired. Don't fall asleep. You don't want to fall asleep in the stand. But if you're up there, you're up there. And he's like, okay, I can do it. And we can talk about actually how the whole thing went down if you want. But end of the day, he got it done. He sat up in that stand as a 12-year-old boy by himself. It's kind of cold for two and a half hours and didn't make a peep and got the job done. Like that to me was super impressive. Yeah. There's grown men who, I can't even do that. Like I, that, that, it would be hard for me to sit there because I have my phone. Like, let's be honest, you know, yeah. like I've got my phone. He didn't have a phone. He had no distractions, 100% dialed in and got it done. He was just so focused and probably from oh, like so his fascination focused. with it, with hunting and reading all this stuff. Like that was his time. Like he was probably. Yeah, he loved it. You know, there's he loved it. definitely something to take from that, you know, that excitement and kids that they, you know, for something as simple as sitting in a tree stand for a few hours, you know? Yeah, man. <laughs> That's yeah, it awesome. Was cool. It was a good experience. Well, cool. So I kind of want to turn this a little bit different. So as we're recording this, um, it's the end of 2020. And when this comes out here in, in a week or so, we'll be just getting into 2021. And, and I, mm-hmm. I listen to your podcast a lot because of the way that I, I, I really admire the way you prioritize things and how you set goals and how you go through things. And I want to ask, I just did a solo podcast that as we're recording this release today, um, where I kind of mm-hmm. went through what my 2021 looks like. And I kind of broke it down into how by quarter and how I plan on going through those things. And my idea of how I set goals and work towards things and kind of lay out my day has adapted immensely over the years. And I keep tweaking it, sure. finding out what works for me personally. And I love learning from other people that have their ways and seeing how that can fit into my whole system. And when it comes to, you know, a lot of well, everybody that listens to this podcast is a hunter and, you know, some are entrepreneurs, some are business owners, some aren't and it all, but the one thing that you can all, that you can pull together from all of this is with proper planning and with discipline and, and everything else and focus when you have these certain goals, whether it be hunting or anything else, I think they all correlate and they all overlap and things that I have with hunting goals. When I first did my trip out West for the first time ever, that made me a better person in every other aspect because the amount of things that I had to put in place and prepare and the discipline to, you know, getting in shape for that and and doing everything. So I guess long story short, I want to hear how you kind of go into a new year, if that's something that you focus on, or if this is just kind of a continuation on what the previous year is and just kind of talk a little bit about that process for you. Yeah, I don't, I don't really look at the new year as some miraculous date. Like there's no difference to me between 12.01 a.m. on January 1st and 11.59 p.m. on December 31st. So I I don't really get caught up in that. The only difference for me is it's the start of a new quarter. And so you said you break your yearly plans into quarterly plans. That's exactly what I do too. Um, I, I Actually, I don't even really get too heavily vested or involved in the annual plan I have themes and general directions of where I want to go, but I'm hyper-focused on a quarterly plan. And then I break it down even further than that. I break it down into four primary categories. So the first category for me is what I call calibration. And so calibration is getting right with myself. And this is in order, by the way. This is the priorities. Like I take care of myself first. I've got four kids. I've been married for almost 17 years now. Uh, I've got order of man. I mean, I've got a lot of responsibilities just like anybody listening, but I always take care of myself first, not at the expense of others, but take care of myself first. So calibration is about getting right with your, your mind, your body, and your soul. That could be spiritual goals, 
Uh, that could be some sort of meditation, reading books. For me, my calibration goal for the first quarter is to build a canoe. So I'm going to spend the next 90 days building a canoe. This is an opportunity for me to be learning something, an opportunity for me to have my own space where I'm figuring things out and I'm hyper-focused on this particular goal of mine. And that 90-day segment is what I focus on. So that's calibration. Next is I focus on connection. So connection is your relationships that you have with other people. Uh, so whether that's your spouse or your children or a coworker or a colleague or your mother or father, whoever it is, you're hyper-focused. You have a specific goal for that, what I call quadrant of relationships or connection. Uh, next is uh, condition. So this is your physical health. And this could include sleep, nutrition, strength, stamina. Maybe you're training and preparing for a hunt but you have a specific objective with relation to your physical body. And then the fourth uh, quadrant that we cover is contribution. So contribution is becoming a man of value. So how do you take your knowledge, your information, your expertise, your skill set, turn it outwards, add value, put value into the world? Sometimes that's just going to be uh, charitable contributions. Maybe you want to coach a, a youth sports team and that's your contribution. And other times maybe it's uh you want to earn a new designation or credential so that you can charge more for your services. So these are all ways that we can add value. Uh, so I focus on those four main quadrants over a quarter at a time. Um, at the end of this quarter, in fact, I've already done it. I evaluate how the quarter went, the previous quarter went, make adjustments where necessary. And look, the only reason I do any of this it, and this is different than what you hear from a lot of goal setting. A lot of goal setting is hyper-focused on the goal, the outcome in and of itself. The only reason I focus on goals or even think about my goals is so I can reverse engineer it backwards into a tactic. And a tactic is something that I can do on a daily basis that without fail will inevitably move me to my goal, to my objective. So I don't get hyper-focused on the objective. I'm only putting it there as a pin in the map and then I'm taking my steps each day to get me to that point. And I know if I do these things, I define those tactics, those daily tactics as the win that the outcome will take care of itself. Okay. So, yeah. So, like you said, you're creating these goals, but essentially you're working backwards, engineering that backwards to the daily task. And when you come into right. like these daily tactics, as, as you call them, um, each of, do you have, say, per day, one for calibration, connection, condition, contribution that you work towards? It. Is that how you do that? That's as simple as that. So I define my my victory over the day if I get my four points, for lack of a better term. If I do those four things. Now, that's not to say those are the only four things I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, for example, if um, uh, I'm just trying to think of... Uh, something that I, that I would do. Okay. So here, here's an example. So I want to build a, uh, a robot, a battle bot with my second son. You met him when we were hunting. So I want to build a robot, a battle bot with him. So that will be my connection objective is to build this thing with him. So we're connecting, we're relating, we're having fun. Right. But that's not to say that I'm going to not spend any time with my wife or that I'm not going to do podcast outreach, that I'm not going to try to develop and build the relationship you and I have, for example. It's just I'm hyper-focused on that thing, and I, that's, that's what I'm focused on, but I'm still maintaining everything else that's going on in my life. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And so how, I guess, how are you prioritizing these, these things? So are those four things kind of all sit, like, equal priority or how are you looking at that when you go through your day and how, how you're taking those steps towards completing them? Or maybe I'm thinking of it wrong, but just trying no, to I think you're right. But I think you're kind of tiptoeing around something that isn't, doesn't necessarily work. And that's the balance conversation. So a lot of guys will ask, you know, how do you balance work and family? Balance isn't this this, this perpetual state of, you know, homeostasis where everything's equally balanced. Balance is think about on a, on a surfboard or a skateboard or even hiking up the mountain on a hunt. Like you're not balanced. What you're doing is you're making thousands and thousands of micro adjustments. So you're climbing up the face of this mountain and you put your right foot out to take a step and you step on the point of a, of a little rock, right? Now you're off balance. So 
what do you do? You adjust, right? Naturally, you don't think about it, but you adjust. You shift your weight, you take a step with your left foot, or you replant your right foot, but you're making a bunch of little micro adjustments along the way to keep you upright. Well, that's exactly how I look at the work-life balance scenario. Sometimes my the situation with my family or my wife or outside circumstances require more of my time, energy, and attention. And so they will get that as needed. And other times I can be fully committed and fully present and double down on the business because that's what needs my energy and attention. So I, I think we run into a trap when we believe that everything just needs to be this perfect thing. And once you find the formula, then everything will align. No, it's it's thousands and thousands of micro adjustments on a daily basis based on your goals, your priorities, your objectives, and external circumstances. Frankly, some beyond your control. COVID, for example. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're so wrapped up in this is my plan and I have to do these things, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, then all of a sudden you have this response to COVID. Okay, well, how's that gonna that just threw in a, a wrench into your entire plan? And what most people will do because they don't have any sort of flexibility built into their plan or they think balance is just equal attention towards all of their objectives, it's catastrophic. It derails everything rather than saying, okay, well, you know, adjust. Like, yeah, so my commute changed or I'm not working at the office, now I'm working at home or, uh, you know, I'm furloughed for 30 days or 60 days. So adjust, pivot. And that's what it means to balance to me. Yeah. No, I've, I've never heard it explained that way, but that makes total sense. And, and because as I, I, I've talked about it on here before, but that the whole work life balance relationships, hunting, all that stuff, I've struggled with figuring out what that looks like at times and yeah. trying to figure out what I was considering, you know, a plan for it. And, uh, I, I guess I, I never thought of it that way as far as I think that was a really good analogy there as far as just like readjusting as you're going through and, and doing that. But I just, I don't know. I guess I've never thought of it that way. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. Let's take the hunting community. You know, when I, so I grew up until I was about 13 years old in Southern California and it was a concrete jungle. I wasn't introduced to hunting. I wasn't around guns. That just wasn't something that was part of my life until I moved to a small town in Southern Utah. And that just opened my eyes to outdoors and nature and the hunting community. And as much as I admired and appreciated those guys, what I also saw is that, that a lot of these guys were abusing the, the, the other relationships they had in the name of hunting. And what I've, what I mean by that is that they were, they were gone and they weren't available and it was just kind of this expectation and this is just how it is. And, and that was at the expense of the other priorities they said were important to them. But as I get more immersed into this world, I've seen a lot of, I guess I, I've never really thought about it this way, but I guess I'd say more thoughtful hunters, I, I guess, or more well-rounded hunters where I talk with a lot of guys who are very conflicted about you know, I'm gone for three months out of the year. And how does that affect my wife? And how does that affect my children? And those are actually good questions. That means you're being thoughtful about it. So, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it's like, okay, you got to put, you can only have 90 days and this person can only, I don't know. You guys have to figure out that out for yourself. But I think the best thing that you can do is communicate those expectations with the people who are going to be impacted by it and give them a say within reason about how this is going to work and and be able to uh, compromise to a degree because, you know, those things are important too. I've seen guys who are extremely fit, for example, get so wrapped up in being fit that they're horrible fathers and husbands because they're not available. And it's like at the end of their life, they're going to look back and think, okay, you were jacked, but nobody likes you, you know, or, or a hunting. Okay, well, at the end of the day, you... You shot thousands and thousands of animals and had great experiences, but you have never been to your son's baseball game. Like, I don't know what the balance is for you or for anybody listening, but you need to communicate those expectations. You need to have those conversations. There needs to be some boundaries in place and everybody needs to be on the same page. That to me seems fair, especially when you commit to another person and uh, you have obligations and responsibilities like your children and your work and other things. 
Yeah. I mean, and, and that's going to look different for everybody, depending course, on what their scenario is. is, what their relationship right. is, who they're married to, you know. And I mean, look, here's an example. Take Adam Greentree. Do you, do you know Adam? Have you been connected? Okay. I've, I've never met him, but I, I just okay. followed along with his Instagram for a long time. S- solid dude. Solid as they come. Kimmy, his wife, is all about hunting. So they go out together and they hunt and they live that hunter's life. And that's different than the relationship I have with my wife. And that's okay. But the dynamic for them is different than it is for me. So there is no one size fits all. But I I think it is important we communicate these things and be open about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. What's your motive? Is it to escape or is it to add value to your life and ultimately to the lives of the people that you have responsibility for and have committed to? Yeah. And then I mean, that also, I mean, that all comes back to your core values and kind of how you split it up into those four categories there, you know, under the, the connection side of things there. I mean, it's right. all dependent on what you, what you value and you have as your priorities and then being able to adjust it. And I think the communication thing is one thing that I've learned from talking to people like yourself and some others that I would consider people that I look up to a a friend of mine. I'd have to connect you to him sometime is Dan Staten. I just had him on my podcast. He owns a company called Elk Shape has a podcast. Used to own a CrossFit gym. I know of him. And he is, he is, I think he does a great job, at least from the outside looking in um, from a side of being able to have a great family and personal relationship with his kids and his wife and everything, but also get to hunt. And he talks about it too, from the standpoint of he was all communicating at the beginning of the year, if I want to do these hunts at this time, I talk to her about it and decide what's going to work for the family. And that might mean that if I want to go on hunt for elk for a month straight in September, that in March, when I'd like to be out shed hunting, that I'm doing work around the house or we're going to different places. There's some, you know, give and take that comes along with it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And you know what I've seen a lot of people do is, is and I, and I'm talking about men, you know, because we, we exclusively do talk with men. A lot of this stuff applies to women as well. And so it'll apply. Um, I'll see a lot of men who will blame their lack of being able to do it on their wives. Like, Oh, my wife won't let me. I'm like, how pathetic is that? Like you, you're a grown ass man. Like you make your own decisions, you know? And so if you and your wife have made a decision, don't pin it on her. Like you made that decision just as much as she did. So be truthful about it. Uh, it was just as much your decision. And if you feel confident in that decision, why would you pawn it off on somebody else? Just own it. Yeah, you know, hey, I'm not going to be able to make that hunt because uh, I've put in a lot of hours this year. And um, so, you know, I'm going to be home for my family. And, you know, I, I know you'd like to be out there, but you made that decision and that's okay too. Like make those micro adjustments as needed. Yeah. And and, and I, I don't know. I've I, I don't have any kids yet, um, but I have a girlfriend that I'm in a long-term relationship with. And one of the things that, like, if I go out hunting a lot or I'm doing something, if I feel guilty at all in my own mind, like I didn't make something at peace or didn't go, it drives me nuts. I don't even enjoy the hunting part. So I've found that, you know, yeah. be, you know, being able to, you know, have that communication up front. And if you're, you come to a decision point, like you're saying, not not even close to saying I'm perfect at this, but this is just some, some things as I've right. been going through the process and learning is, uh, yeah, that communication seems to be pretty huge. To- well, and guilt isn't necessarily an indicator that you're wrong. I think a lot of people think that too, like, oh, I'm guilty, so I shouldn't do this. No, that's, that's not necessary. I mean, maybe that could be it, yeah. but that's not necessarily true. I, I think anybody who's thoughtful and most of the people listening to this podcast are going to be because they wouldn't be listening if they weren't thinking about some of these things. So anybody who's thoughtful is probably going to have some level of guilt. I remember one of the very first hunts that I was on with, with Kip folks, uh, we were in Arizona. It was a spot and stock hunt. It was a, it was a great hunt. The first night I was out there, I'm walking around the desert of Arizona and I'm thinking to myself, you know, what the hell are you doing? Your wife's at home. Your kids are at home. You're out here enjoying, you're just walking around like, <laughs> like this isn't fair, but that again, that's not an indicator that it's a ru- that is wrong. It's just an indicator that something needs to be addressed. And, and like you said, to reiterate your point, you have those conversations, you open the lines of communication and you get that stuff off your chest, you get on the same page and then you enjoy the hunt, you enjoy the process. And she's grateful that you get to go do that. And she's grateful when you come home and those are good things too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So 
to to go back, I, I kind of wanted to dive a little bit deeper into your tactics and how you're how are you assigning those tactics or or coming up with those tactics for the day? How are those? How do you prioritize those or what those tactics are going to be essentially? Because I feel like for the, me the, sometimes I get into a point where. I'll have a whole bunch of things that I want to do. And maybe that's where it comes down to having the four main points and not overcrowding it. But uh, so I might've answered mm-hmm. my own question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah. That's not only is that the benefit of having the four quadrants that you're focusing on, but it's also the benefit of working in 90 day segments. So you can, you can work in a 90 set day segment, then you can evaluate how that 90 days went and then you can adjust. Maybe you want to double down on your current tactics and objectives and that's great. Or maybe you decide, you know, that's not relevant anymore. Building a canoe, for example, is my 90 day goal. In 90 days, I should be done with it. And then I can move on to something else that is enticing or intriguing. Or you know what? Maybe I love it and I want to build a better canoe or a, a more complicated canoe or something, right? So you evaluate it and then you adjust along the way. But to answer your question about uh, tactics, you're actually deciding what your one tactic per quadrant is ahead of time. And it's one thing that you do every single day without fail. It's, it's one thing. So for example, I've had guys who uh, really want to connect with, a, with their wives on a more deeper and more significant level. And so maybe their tactic is, uh, I, I, I want to uh, let my wife know every day show her some form of appreciation, for example. And and so that doesn't mean you need to do the same thing every day, but one day it might be a phone call. The next day it might be a random text. The, the next day it might be, I don't know, a note under a pillow. The next day you might bring a, a bouquet of flowers home or whatever. I, I'm just giving you examples. So your tactic might like specifically might adjust based on circumstances. But again, the one tactic that an individual like that would choose is to show some level of appreciation towards their significant other. And that is their one tactic for 90 days. And the whole goal is to go unbroken for 90 days. Okay. So you're not with with these tactics. This isn't a different tactic every day. You have the same tactic, but your way of doing it might be different every day. Correct. And, and uh, you're going to have other tasks. So there's a difference between tactics and tasks. So your tasks are things that need to get done. So for example, uh, you and I are having this podcast, right? This is a task. It's, it's something that you have on your calendar. It's something I have on our calendar. Another task is that you had to send me a, a message and give me the link for this meeting. That's a task. That's not a tactic. That's just something that needs to be done. Maybe you need to reach out to this individual. You need to call this person. You need to follow up on this assignment or this project. Those are tasks. And those change from day to day based on what you're trying to accomplish, based on external circumstances. But your tactic is something that you do without fail, inevitably, day in and day out. If your, ta- if your objective, for example, is to lose 20 pounds this quarter, then your tactic is 45 minutes of workout every single day without fail. You still have your tasks and your things you need to do, but this is your tactic for your condition quadrant, which is to lose 20 pounds. Okay. Yeah. That makes, that makes complete sense when, so when you have, okay, so breaking away from the tactics side of thing and you had tasks, say your Mm -hmm. tasks, how are you, how are you organizing those prioritizing those to go through the day? Are you keeping a list of some sort or how, how does that look for you? I, I've got it right here. It's always right on my desk. And so, uh, you know, as an example, um, let me just pull one up here. So like, like here's an example you can see, and there's a lot of different stuff on here, but you can see right here, these are my daily tasks. Okay. Yep. So this is a weekly planner that I use. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll write down the tasks that you need to do. So I'll just pull up this week's and give you guys an example of some of the tasks that I need to to do. Let me just pull it up here. All right. So I need to work on some team logos with our company. Um, the mortgage payment, I needed to make the mortgage payment that's already done. I need to do some videos for our battle planning app that we're coming out with. Um, I need to send some logo ideas to our graphic designers. Um, I still need to mail out a few last remaining Christmas gifts, which are more like new year's gifts at this point. (laughs) Uh, and then I need to take care of some, some tax documents for the end of the year. So those are my tasks. Okay. That I have documented written down. 
So what I'll do is I'll go through and pick the most pressing one or the one I can get done the quickest or whatever. There's all sorts of ways you can measure that. And then I'll literally just go in like the mortgage payment. When I go in, I'll just exit off. If there's a task that I can't complete, but I've started, I'll just put one dash through it. And that means I've started it. And then when I complete it, I exit out and then it's done. So again, this is a weekly planner that I've created and I use and anything that's not done for that day, I've got it right there for a week. So it's just listed in front of me. If it doesn't get done to the end of the week, I just roll it over into the next week's planning system. Okay. That's what I was going to ask you how, how that goes across. I think that could be, um, that can be applicable in so many different things. You know, even anybody that, you know, at their day job as they're going through and trying to address different things and, or, you know, as you're planning hunts, you know, for me, say, and if I were to go through your program, I, I think it would be under the, the calibration category, say, I, I want to have a, tell me if I'm doing this correctly, but I want to have an idea where I'm going to be hunting in the first quarter. So for 2021, my Western hunt, I usually plan one Western hunt. I want to have right. that plan detailed and laid out in 90 days. And my, my tactic would be do me, I don't know. I'm doing one thing every day that works yeah, you towards it might that. Be, or, um, or how would let, you, let's say in, uh, let's say in March, you're going to, you, you, you've got a hunt coming up. I'm just throwing out ideas here. Okay. You've got a Western spot and stock in March. You're going to go take care of it. So you've got 90 days to prepare for it. That's your objective. Successfully complete that hunt is your objective. Yep. Right. Okay. So now what are your tactics for me? What I would say is I would say it's, it's, it's 30 to 60 minutes of daily planning for the hunt. So daily planning could include your fitness, right? There's going to be some bleed over and crossover into your condition quadrant. Yep. But fitness is certainly part of the planning for a, for a spot and stock hunt. Certainly hundred percent. Okay. So you've got fitness, you've got equipment, you've got knowing the area, you've got your skill set. I don't know if you're rifle or bow hunting, but you've got to develop and work on your skill set. So that could mean 30 minutes of slinging arrows. Like there's so many different things, but your tactic is 30 to 60 minutes per day of hunt prep. And that's going to vary based on the day and what needs to get done. But there's always going to be a minimum of 30 to 60 minutes of hunt preparation. Yeah. So that could just be research or outreach. A lot of different things that could be. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Now that makes sense using that as an example too and kind of helping plan that. So I guess, Ryan, from, from that standpoint, you know, you went through kind of your goal setting and, go, and as we did on here, we worked backwards and kind of worked back mm -hmm. through all the way through the tactics and the daily tasks and how you're organizing those. Do you have anything else that you think that would add value or that I'm missing as far as asking you questions based on your, your goal setting and your, and your daily planning? I know it goes into a lot further detail and that's why you have yeah. a whole business around it, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, but I mean, I, I gave you 90 to hundred percent. I mean, if that's all you took and you just went and applied that every day, you would succeed without fail, you would succeed. But there is, there are two other factors that don't get, that don't get talked about. So the first is that you have to do a morning planning session without fail. You have to. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be some drawn, long drawn out process. It could quite literally take you 10 minutes in some cases, 20 minutes, maybe the next day, but it could be very, very short. But that planning session consists of you going through your plan, whatever that plan is, prioritizing your tasks, ensuring that you're going to get your tactics done, taking a look at your calendar, building in buffers. It's important you build in buffers in your calendar because if you stack uh, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with no buffer, you, you kind of become akin to like a doctor who overschedules his calendar and then the person next to him has to wait 20 minutes because he he was over one minute from his meeting in the morning and you're at the, at the end of the night. Now he's 20, 30 minutes behind or, or longer. Yep. Okay. So build buffers because there's always things that will come up. So you build buffers, but you plan out your calendar, you plan out your tasks, you prioritize your day, uh, and then you execute, you get after it. So that's the first thing. You got to have that morning session. The next thing, and this thing gets overlooked all the time. You have to have an afternoon or evening session. And that's taking same, t same amount of time, 20 or 30 minutes. You pull out your calendar, you pull out your organizer, your Google calendar, whatever it is you're using. 
And you go through and you ask yourself, what did I get done here? Okay, that's done, that's done, that's done, that's done. Okay, what didn't I get done? Okay, well, I still have these items. Okay, now, tomorrow, what's your plan for tomorrow? Okay, so I have a 9 a.m. call. I've got a 12 o'clock podcast. I've got to go to the doctor with my kids at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And in these buffers, I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to do my hunt prep at 2 or I'm going to do it after I'm out of work, but you go through and you actually map out your day. Okay. And then I've got these four items, uh, that, that didn't get addressed. So when I get in at nine o'clock, I'm going to do this one first. So now you're just teed up for the morning. And the beauty of this is you get to shut everything off and go be present in another area of your life, like your relationship or your kids or your extracurricular activities, whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. And also it makes the morning session that much easier. Because now when you come in in the morning, all you have to do is pull out what you planned last last night and say, okay, well, this look, still looks pretty good. Oh, you know what? But uh, Bo did send me a text and he said that he couldn't do it at 530. He had to do it at six o'clock. So let me make, just make that little adjustment real quick. And so you would just adjust based on any new information you received. And you do that day in and day out over a, a 90 day period. How How could you not succeed? Like, how could you not win if you did that? Yeah, and and the little things that you might miss throughout, and say you didn't, you got five of the seven tasks done that you had in the day. That's still winning, you know. If of you're, of course, going, you know what I mean. Because like I, I've always looked at it, and one of my my bosses at work has taught me this. I always took it, you know. Some you, you're never going to be a hundred percent the way there on anything, you know. Yeah, you know, strive for that. But when you strive for that and do it, then that eighty percent of the way is is still great, you know, and I, I, I well, think- let's say you do hit a hundred percent. Yep. Let's say you get it all done. The only, what you're going to do because you're, you're an achiever. If you're hitting a hundred percent on these things, you're an, you're an achiever. Obviously you're a high driver, you're a hard charger. You're an achiever. You're going to pivot. Okay. I got a hundred percent. So I guess I can go harder. So, uh, yeah, it's the same thing in the weight room. You know, you hit your PR, you hit whatever it is, your prescribed weight, whatever it is you're doing. You don't, you don't, you're not satisfied. You're not like, oh, okay, I've hit the pinnacle of my achievement. No, you're like, okay, well, that means I have to go up and wait. And it's the same thing with your plan. If you hit 100% of your plan, high achievers, hard chargers are going to evaluate it and say, oh, okay, well, I got that done. So I guess uh, I on to bigger and better. Yeah. And then you just reevaluate and adjust that evening or that afternoon or the next morning and you get right back to it. That's, I, I think that's great advice and, and, yeah, I, I I like that, and I, I like the the planning and the and I think that one of the biggest things that you said there is that afternoon evening session on review, and then that helps you out for the next day. Like you said, you're not stressed out on what you got to do or not surprised by anything, but yeah. you've already looked at it and and are ready for it. You know, you're not coming into a meeting, you forgot about it 9 a.m. Right. And you're like, oh shit, I didn't prepare for this or I didn't do this. You, you kind of you're continually checking that box. I think, um, for me personally, I know a lot of people who are listening to this podcast probably experience this as well. Um, it's not necessarily the the greatest risk is probably not that you prepared or did not prepare for a meeting. The greatest risk, at least for me, is that I can't shut it off at the end of the day. And then I end up alienating the people that I love and care about because I can't shut the work off. So I had a friend of mine, we were, I was a financial planning uh, advisor in another life before Order of Man. And one of the guys that I worked with, he had this practice when he was done with his work day, he would pull into his driveway and he would get out and he'd, he'd start to walk in the door and he had this tree just outside of his door and it had this big thick limb that kind of hung out just, you know, seven, eight feet above him. And every day he would literally jump up on the limb and hang from the limb as long as he could. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, to me, it signifies hanging work at the door. And so he would leave all of his work and everything else at the door. And then he would go in and he would be fully present for his wife and his kids. And that's actually the same thing as this afternoon session is once I do this, I know it's like, shut that off, turn that off. You're done. You're planned for tomorrow. Tomorrow, There's nothing else that, that, that you need to get done. Everything is accounted for. The system's in place. Now just 
go be present and go be available. And that has helped me immensely with my personal life. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely something for me and I'm sure a lot of people listening that I can take from from this. And if, if there's anything to take from it is that ability to shut that off from, definitely. from it's that. hard, it's hard, but you have to have these little systems in place, whether you're going to hang on that limb yeah. or, you know, do it in some sort of a, a, a strategy session. Those things are going to help make that transition for you. Awesome. Well, Ryan, I want to, I want to be, you know, I want to be thoughtful of your time and everything here. So I'm gonna let you go eat with your family and everything. But before that, I want to ask you to be able to give the listeners where they can find some more information about you and, and maybe just even give a brief uh, synopsis of your services that you, that you offer over at Order of Man. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If you're interested more in what we do, um, check out the podcast. You're listening to a podcast. So Order of Man is our podcast. Uh, or connect with me. I'm very active on Instagram mostly. So you can connect with me on Instagram at Ryan Mickler. Uh, my last name's M-I-C-H-L-E-R. Uh, we've got the podcast. We've got all the social media channels. All that stuff's free. We've got merchandise. And then we've got our exclusive brotherhood, which is called the Iron Council. So we've got just under 800 members of the Iron Council who are all men committed to helping each other, growing, holding each other accountable to the plans that we've been talking about today uh, and just having accountability and brotherhood. So that's a pretty cool tool as well. And you can find that at orderofman.com slash iron council. Awesome. Well, Ryan, again, thank you so much for coming on here. I've been looking forward to this conversation since yeah, man, I, I appreciate met, it. met you there. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great evening. Thanks, man. You too. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.